Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James Olfer here with you, and we're glad that you are with us this afternoon and ready for another study from God's Word. I want to pick your brain a little bit or cause you to think, and that's really the objective of this program, is to get you to think and uh, let's reason together. That was Paul's um, mode of operation, his M.O., when he went into a place in Acts 17, Verses 1 and 2, for example, he reasoned with them. And so that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to get you to think. We're trying to get you to use your, your, your mind and use the ability that God gave us to reason so that we can find out what his will is. One of the things that I want you to be considering uh, for today is, is this. Is it, is it wrong to be confident that you're right. Is it wrong to be right? Now I'm not saying is it wrong to think you're right, because you might think you're right and you'd be wrong. But I'm I'm saying if you know the truth about something and you know it's right, is it wrong then to express a fact that you know to be undeniably, unquestionably the truth. So that's really why I'm I'm where I'm wanting to go this afternoon. I want you to be thinking about the fact that there is a thing called truth. John seventeen seventeen, Jesus said, "Sanctify them with thy truth. Thy word is truth." Now, Pilate in uh, in John chapter eight, when Pilate was um, when he was had Jesus on trial, and uh, I'm sorry, not John chapter 8. Uh, John, uh, uh, 16 is, um, at least where I want to look here. But Pilate asked a question, uh, you know, what is truth? And uh, I said 16, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm having a pretty bad day today. It's John 18 is where I'm wanting to go. And I've had trouble all all day thinking of, of scriptures and, and saying what I want to say. But in John 18, when Jesus is on trial, Pilate asked Jesus, you know, what is truth? And friends, when we're when we're looking for the truth, we have to recognize that God's word is the ultimate authority on truth. Uh, it is truth. It is. It's what's right. It just, it's. It's not going to be changing. It's not the. Um, it's not something that's going to be. Uh, one thing one day and, and different the next day. And so when I'm asking you, is it wrong to be right? I'm saying, is it wrong to be steadfast and unmovable and confident that what you're saying or what you believe is, is right? And the reason I ask that is because when we're studying the Bible, we have to have an open mind. And by that I mean we have to be willing to accept the truth, even though it may not be something that we've always thought or believed it was. And so we have to be willing to say, you know what, that is that is a conclusion that I had not come to before, but yet it makes sense at least stop and consider uh, if it is if it is true or if it does make more sense than maybe what you have previously believed or been taught. And so you have to have an open mind. Now, I will say this. Sometimes uh, when people have an open mind, they have it open too much. I mean, you don't want to let just any, any garbage in. But you have to have an open mind in the sense of you have to be willing to at least, at least let the truth come in and and stimulate your, your your mind and say all right this this has to be true and but not so much not have such an open mind that your brain falls out you know some people's mind so open that you can put anything in it and take anything out so we're we're trying to stimulate your your thinking process and are you willing to accept the truth and are you willing to say yes that's true and if if it is the case you're willing to say that are you wrong for doing it? And the reason I ask that is because oftentimes people will criticize members of the Lord's Church 
because of a simple fact that we're confident that the Bible says something or the Bible teaches something and then we turn around and say that. And, you know, friends, it's not, it's not, a, a, it's not a brag or a boast or anything like that to say with confidence that something is a definitive truth. If I said there are 12 inches in a foot, and I'm confident there are 12 inches in a foot. And I'm confident that this, you know, table that I'm, I'm sitting at is, um, you know, four foot wide. And I know that because I've measured it. Then why would anyone get mad about that? For simply stating an obvious truth that can be measured, that can be um, uh, verified by using the standard of a yardstick or a measuring tape. If someone says something is so many inches wide or so many feet wide, it can be verified by a number of different people and it will, be, it will come up the same thing every time. Now, the reason I say that is because when we're talking about the truth, we're talking about what a person must do to be saved or things pertaining to salvation, Sometimes people don't like the, the, a, a bold statement of truth or just a statement of fact. And so we get asked questions sometimes as members of the Lord's Church. We get asked questions about, well, do y'all believe y'all the only ones going to heaven? Members of the Church of Christ, do y'all think y'all the only ones going to heaven? Now, friends, the only way I, I really know to answer that without I'm automatically putting up a wall, for someone putting up a wall to hear the answer is, is you have to go to the Bible. And let's see what the Bible says about going to heaven and what is required to go to heaven. And if I can find that being a member of the Church of Christ is required to go to heaven, then the answer unquestionably is, yes, you have to be a member of the Lord's Church to go to heaven. Now, Someone's going to throw some objections. Well, what about people in the Old Testament? We're not talking about Old Testament times. We're talking about you and me today. We're listening. You're listening to my voice, then I'm talking to you. I'm not talking about people that lived, you know, 2,000 years ago. I'm not talking about people that lived before Christ. I'm talking about people who lived under the New Testament uh, authority that was put in place when Christ died and came into effect when Christ died. That's what I'm talking about. Everybody after Christ died will be saved one way and one way alone and that is by being members of the body of Christ. I mean you, you're going to have to be saved this way. If you are if you're a man or a woman and you're you expect to go to heaven then there's only one way you can expect to get there and that is by being a member of the church of Christ. Now that's so for instance that's not that's not a that's not a, a brag or that's not a statement of, of uh, of conceit, that is just, that's a statement. And the, and the reason I say that, I mean, that's a statement of truth, and the reason I say that is because I can verify it by the Bible. Just like that tape measure, you can take the tape measure and you can measure the table, and you can know whether I'm telling you the truth or not. Friends, you can take the Bible, and you can know if I'm telling you the truth or not. And so when someone says, well, do you think that members of the Church of Christ are the only ones going to heaven? Without a, without a hesitation, I'm going to say, yes, only members of the Church of Christ this side of the cross, we're going to heaven. But now let me tell you, not every member of the Church of Christ is going to go to heaven. You see the difference? Just because you're a member of the Church of Christ does not mean you're going to go to heaven. But if you get to heaven, if you're living this side of the cross, if you're, if you're going to get to heaven, then you're going to do it as a member of the body of Christ. Now, uh, so we need to we define well, why is that why is that the case? Well, that's what we're going to look at. Okay, let me give you contact information if you want to reach me two seven six three four zero two six five three two seven six three four zero two six five three. A word from the Lord at gmail dot com. A word from the Lord at gmail dot com is how you can reach me. And if you want to call that number two seven six three four zero two six five three two seven six three four zero two six five three. That's how you can reach me. And we'll put you on the air right now. Or if you want to call uh, uh, another number, here's two numbers that I'm going to give you. The area code is 336-426-427-9696. 
that's 427-9696, 427-WMYN, or 627-9563, 627-9563, 627-WLOE. Now, those phone numbers will get you on the air, and we can have a conversation uh, live, and we'll be glad to hear from you, and hope that you will call if you have a question. And we'll have some discussion on this matter now. So let's let's get back to this, our question. <clears throat> why would you study a question like that? Well, why would you study if, if that is the case about do you have to be a member of the Church of Christ to go to heaven? Well, friends, the reason why I, st I want to start there is because many people say the church is not important at all. And so if the church is not important, then why would the church even be in existence? I think it's very interesting that people will say the church is not important, yet they're members of churches. Now the Bible talks about the church. Christ said, upon this rock, I'll build my church, Matthew 16, 18. And then someone else comes along and says it's not important. But Man comes along and copies the Lord's church. They twist the doctrines. They come up with different churches, different kinds of beliefs and so forth, but they still have their own churches. And But then they turn around and say, well, it's not important. Well, it was important enough to you to copy it. it the Lord's church was important enough for you to try to imitate it, you know, to try to... Pattern yourself after it in some regard, anyway. I know you change things to make it your own, but but still, you you've imitated it in some way. You know, someone comes up with uh, you know Kleenex, and people say, "Well, you know, a Kleenex is not important." But then you have all kinds of people making tissue paper to blow your nose on, right? And then someone says, "Well, let's put some lotion in that thing, make it a little better." Why? It's not important. I mean, you know, why, why would you copy something, imitate something, if it's not really important? So it really must be important the fact that men have come along and tried to imitate it and duplicate and make it make their own version of it. Well, it must be important. It must be important. I mean, how many times do you, when you go to the, <clears throat> excuse me, when you go to the grocery store, you see the name brand, right? You see the name brand of a product, and then you have the Walmart brand or the Food Line brand or whatever right beside it. Why, why would you go to the go to the effort of making your own version of this product unless it was important enough because you thought, well, so if someone's buying the name brand, if someone's buying the Del Monte or someone's buying the Hunt or once somebody's buying the, you know, Duncan Hines or whatever, someone's buying the name brand, well... I can make my own brand and sell it a little cheaper and get some money from it. So it must be important enough if you're imitating it. And that's that's what I'm saying about the church. If if all these churches are so unimportant, or if the Lord's church is unimportant, why are so many people copying it? So uh, we're going to be answering this question about do you have to be a member of the Lord's church to go to heaven? Do you think that members of the Lord's church are the only ones going to heaven? Uh, and I think when we look at things about the Lord's church, friends, I want you to reason with me and see what the conclusion definitely has to be on this matter. And if we start with the importance of the church, then you're going to see, well, if the church is important, then, well, I must, I must need to, I must needs be a member of the church that you read about in the Bible. Now, let me tell you this: when we're talking about the talking about the church, we're not talking about a denomination. I'm not talking about denominations that were started, you know, 600, 1,000 years or however many years later after the, the, the Lord's church. I'm talking about the church you read about in the New Testament. The church that Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build. Now, the denominations will claim, well, we're, part of the, we're, we're all part of the Lord's church. But those are the same people that have just told you the church is not important. Again, why would you insist on being a part of of the Lord's church if the church is not really important. So either it is important, go ahead and admit that it is important, and then we'll determine if the church you're in is part of that important church, or say it's not important, and let's just get rid of the denominations altogether. One way or the other. Either way you go, 
Either way you go, you've got a problem with denominations. I'm not talking about denominations. I'm talking about the importance of the Lord's Church. I'm talking about a body of believers who have obeyed the Lord in order to become members of the body of Christ. And when I say that, I'm talking about people, for example, like those in Acts chapter 2, when they heard uh, Peter and the other men um, preaching, they were preaching in the hearts, said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And when they heard this, with many other words, did he exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. That's verse 40. Verse 41 says, that, that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. What were they added to? What church were people added to in Acts chapter 2? The Bible says, The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. What church was it they were added to? Just answer to yourself. Answer out loud. Or call in and, and, and tell me. What church was it that they were added to in Acts 2 verse 47? T please, just tell me. What church was it? What Was it the Lutheran church? No. Lutheran church wasn't in existence. Was it the Baptist church? No. Luke, the Baptist church wasn't there. The Catholic church? No. It couldn't have been the Catholic church. The Catholic church wasn't even there. So it had to be a church that was different from all the denominations. So when, I was talking, when I'm talking about the church that you read about in the Bible, I'm talking about the church that the Lord adds people to, the church that Jesus built. All right? So let's, let's look at the necessity of the church. Is it even needed? Because if it's not needed, then, then I can say, well, you don't need to be a part of the church of Christ in order to be saved if it's not necessary at all. But I want you to consider, friends, for a moment what the church really is. The church, for one thing, is the place for the saved people. In other words, it is a place that God said, I am going to set up and it's going to be for the saved people. That's the saved people are going to be part of the church. All right? So it's, it's an environment, if you will. It's, it's, a, it, it's a place where God always intended for the saved people to be. Now, listen, in Ephesians 5 and verse 23, Paul says, The, the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. All right, so now I know the body's important because Christ is the Savior of it. Now, I don't think anybody's going to argue, well, yeah, you can be saved without being part of the body. Well, that's wrong. No, no one was going to say that because Christ is the Savior of the body. And if you want to be saved, you've got to be in the body. Isn't that true? Yes, that's true. Now, if we back up to Ephesians 1, 22, listen to what Paul says. He said that God gave Christ to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. So, if the church is the body and Christ is the Savior of the body, then he's the Savior of the church. Now, isn't that important? See, the church is a place where the saved people have been placed. You know, if you... I don't know if um, probably a lot, some of you out there listening have at least canned some food, you know, canned some kind of, of produce. Maybe you had gardens when I was growing up. We canned green beans, and I can, I can remember canning green beans. I can remember my mom making pickles, and I can remember, you know, making our own, even tomato juice. Those are kind of the biggest things that we canned. Now, we put up uh, you know, frozen corn and okra and peas and things like that. But the canned things is what I really remember. And we we had a, a place for those jars of canned vegetables that we that we put up. I mean, we had there was a pantry. I mean, there was a, there was a room in our house where. You know, had cupboards, and that's where things were. And I remember, you know, in the winter, Mom said, all right, we're going to get some green beans, so go get some green beans. So, you, you know, climb up on the, on the shelf and get a jar of green beans down. 
Well, that was the place for the saved green beans or the saved uh, tomatoes or the saved whatever it was. So there was a place for it. Well, the church is the place for the saved. And if the saved aren't in that place, then they're really not going to be saved. Here's a good, here's a good illustration. This is one of the best illustrations I've heard. Uh, and it's not original to me, so uh, I'm, I quit having original thoughts a long time ago. But let me ask you this. Can a fish live out of water? Can a fish live out of water? Well, if any of you have done any kind of fishing, you know, no, a fish cannot live out of water. You take a fish out of water and it's, it's not going to last long. It's not long for this world. As a matter of fact, you take him out of water and hold him up, take a picture, and then you throw him back in the water, you know, if you if you take too many picture pictures, and you put him back in, that he's he's you know he's gonna be belly up. So, a fish cannot live out of water. But now, what keeps the fish alive? Is the water what keeps the fish alive? Now, the answer is no. The water does not keep the fish alive. But the fish is not going to live unless he's in the water. Now the reason I say the water doesn't keep the fish alive is because God keeps the fish alive. Uh, in Matthew 6 and verse 26, Matthew 6 and verse 26, Jesus said, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Now, how does God feed the birds? Does he, does he go outside and, you know, like old man in the park and throw bird seed out and breadcrumbs out? No. He provides, he feeds them with plants and seeds and other things that, that bird, you know, insects, whatever the birds eat, that's how he feeds them. He has provided an environment where they can survive. And that's how he feeds them. The same thing with the fish. God provided an environment for the fish to live. Now, that in, that, in, in the fish's case, it's water. So does the water keep the fish alive? No. The water doesn't keep the fish alive. God keeps the fish alive by providing him with an environment so he can live. And that's the same thing with us. Acts 17, verse 28. Acts 17, and verse uh, 28. Paul said, In him we live, move, and have our very being. So God has provided us with an environment to live, a way to live. All right? Jesus said, you know, pray, give us this day our daily bread. So... God provides us with the means to live, but that's not what keeps us alive. The environment's not what keeps us alive. God keeps us alive as long as we're in the environment in which we're designed to live. If, if you change places with the fish, you will die in the water, and the fish will die out of the water. Why? Because you are not designed to live in the water, and the fish is not designed to live breathing the air. But if we're in the environment where God puts us to live, then yeah, we can survive. So the water does not keep the fish alive. God keeps the fish alive, but he keeps the fish alive in the place that he has provided for the fish to live. Now, let's go back to the church. The church is the place that God provided for the saved. The church is the place that God has provided for the saved. And the saved cannot live outside the church. Let me say it again. The saved cannot live outside the church. You say, well, James, you mean telling me that you can, you can fall away and be lost? That's exactly what I'm telling you. That's exactly what I'm telling you. There are, that's why I said at the very beginning, Every member of the Church of Christ is not going to be saved because they're going to leave the place that God has created for them to survive. And that's the church. 
And that's why the Bible talks about falling away. And it talks about people who are lost, who once knew the truth. Peter, uh, Peter said it this way in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20. He said, If after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, and the latter end is worse with them than the beginning, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog has turned his own vomit again and the sow that was washed her wallowing in the mire. So, yeah, if you leave, if you leave the place where God has, has prepared for the saved to live and survive, yeah, yeah, you'll be lost. Just like that fish out of water. And just like a Christian out of the church, outside of the church, yeah, you're going to be lost. That's why someone said, well, I, I, think there's, I think there's saved people in all denominations. Really? You might as well say, I think there's fish outside of the, outside of the lake. I think there's fish outside, the, outside of all the lakes and the rivers and everything. Really? Well, if they are, they're dead. Because that is not where God intended for fish to live. And God does not intend for Christians to be outside of the body of Christ. And so if you say, well, I'm a Christian and I'm over here in the Baptist church, you're dead. So I, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian and I'm over here in the, in the Methodist. Well, you're dead. Just like that fish. Right? So you, you have to be in the place where God provided. Now you say, well, James, how do you know that's how do you know that, that the church is the church of Christ is that place where God's provided? Well, because the Bible talks about it. Listen, the church was always part of God's plan. You cannot separate God's plan for man's salvation from the church. You just you just can't do it. You can't chop off the church and pull it out of God's plan. In Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 9, I want you to listen. listen. Listen to what Paul said. Paul said that his job was to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. To the intent that now to that principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now listen to what those verses said. The beginning of the mystery which from the beginning of the world. Alright, so it was from the beginning of the world. It was, it was hid it was hid in the mind of God. It was part of the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus, but it was made manifest by the church. The church was part of God's eternal purpose and plan for man's salvation before the world was created. So think about it this way. If you go back to the Bible and you read Genesis 1, and in Genesis 1... The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Before God ever said, let there be light, in his mind, he had already thought about the church that his son was going to die for. He had already thought about the church that was going to be the place for the saved to, to live even before he said that there be light. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth, but before the foundation of the world was laid, God had in his mind how he was going to save mankind. Now friends, you want to tell me the church is not important? It's always been part of God's plan. Now listen, part of God's plan was for Jesus to come and die for the lost. Oh, I think everybody would agree with that, wouldn't they? Listen to this. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, Matthew 20 and verse 28, Jesus said, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. 
Christ came to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, that was, that was part of God's plan. That was part of God's plan, was for Christ to die. But Christ also came to die and build his church. Acts 20, verse 28. Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Christ purchased the church. He purchased the church that was in the mind of God from before the foundation of the world. All right? The eternal plan of God was part of God's plan, just as much as Christ dying was part of God's plan. So, Jesus came to die for the lost. He came to seek and save the lost, Luke 19.10. But he also came to build the church where the saved would then be placed. Acts 2, verse 47. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, let me ask you this, friends. If Jesus came to die for the lost, and he came to build the church where the saved were going to be. Is it necessary to be a member of the church that he died for in order to be saved? I say yes. It, it, therefore, it, you know, being a member of the church of Christ, the church that Christ built, it is an essential part of God's plan to seek and save the lost. It is just as much a part of God's plan as Christ coming and dying for the church is. So if you say, well, the church is not important, it's not essential to God's plan. Well, then you might as well say, neither was Christ coming. Well, Christ coming was essential. Well, then so was the church that he built. He just can't separate the two. So do you need to be a member of the church that Christ built in order to be saved? Well, yeah. That's part of God's plan. Let, let, me, let me give it to you this way. Jesus said he came to do the will of the Father. John 6, John 6 and verse 68. Excuse me, John 6 verse 38. Jesus said, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. So Jesus came to do the Father's will. Now, what did Jesus do when he came? Well, when he came, he said, Upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Matthew 16, 18. And the gates of hell, the gates of death, Hades, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So, he came to do the will of the Father, but yet he built a church. What does it tell you? What does that tell you about the church? It tells me that the church is part of God's will. It was God's plan. It was God's will for Christ to build the church. Why? Because the church is where God was going to put the saved people. Now, just imagine this way. You got, you've got a guy that's, um, you know what I'm saying? He's going to, he's going to get some land. He's going to homestead it. He's going to, he's going to, you know, raise his family and he's going to uh, make everything that is, is, that is needed for their survival. And he tells his son, you know, we, we need to build a barn, we need to build, dig a well, we need to, you know, plant a garden. All those things are essential to the plan of survival. And so the father tells the son, all right, you, you need to do my will. You need to do what I say in order to ensure the survival of our family. And the son goes out and he what? He built a chicken house. Well, if I'm looking at that, I'm saying, well, it must, that must have been part of the father's will. He built the chicken house. You know, if he did exactly what the father's will was, then the chicken house must have been part of of the Father's will. Well, if that was part of God's plan, that's what Christ did. 
And so, yes, it was the will of God for Jesus to build the church because that's where God was going to put the saved people. Now, go back to our analogy. Would a root cellar be essential to that man that's homesteading? Well, if he, if he, if he told his son, look, we need a place to store all of our food in the winter. You know, well, we need to dig a root cellar. We need to build a root cellar. Why? Because that's where we're going to put all of our vegetables. That's where we're going to, we're going to store things in the winter so that we can have food. It is essential part of our survival. That's where we're going to put the things we save. And so the Lord's church is part of God's plan. It's part of his will. That's why he sent his son. He sent his son to do his will. His son built the church. Therefore, the church is part of God's will. Now, friend, do you need to be a member of the church that Christ built in order to be in God's will, in order to be doing what God wants? I say yes. When I see the importance of the church, I say, yeah, yeah, you have to be. Here's, a, here's another one. In John 8, verse 29. John 8, verse 29. Jesus said, He that sent me is with me, and the Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. I do always those things that please him. Well, what was one thing that Jesus did? He built his church. Upon this rock I build my church. Well, if Jesus always did those things that pleased the Father, and one of the things that he did was to build a church where all the saved were going to be placed, it seems to me like the church pleases the Father. Now, if someone comes along and tells me, well, the church is not important. God was pleased, the Father was pleased with it. How do I know? Because Jesus always did the things that pleased the Father, and Jesus built his church. Therefore, Jesus building his church was part of Christ pleasing his Father. Now here's the question you have to ask. Is being a member of the church of Christ, is it going to please the Father? I say yes it is. And if, and if God said for Christ to build the church, do you need to be a member of that church then? So I say being a member of the church of Christ Bill, being a member of the church of Christ, is an essential part of me pleasing God. If Christ did always those things that pleased God, and he built a church which also pleased God, and all the saved are going to be in the church that pleased God, then the only way I'm going to please God is if I'm in the church that his son built while his son was pleasing him. See how they're all tied together? And so when you say, well, I don't know if, if church membership is essential. Well, do you not know how to please the Father? So I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to help you think, friends, and the reason that, yes, you need to be in the church that Christ built. Because it's part of God's will. It's part of God's plan. It's part of what pleases the Father. And so you need to be a part of that. Now, let me ask you this. What, what makes something so valuable? You know, what makes something valuable may be the price. Maybe maybe some sentimental value to it. You know, if your house catches on fire, you, there's probably a couple things that you want to grab before you run out. If you have time, I, w I would say there's nothing more valuable than your life. So if your house does catch on fire, you need to get out. But probably most people would say, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to grab some pictures. You know, family pictures or something like that. But what, what makes it valuable? What makes it so value valuable? That, that people would risk their life for it. Either the, 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 the value of it, the price of it, or how precious it is to you, what it costs, 
or maybe what it would cost to replace? Well, think about the church from this regard. We've already read Acts 20, verse 28. Jesus, which he purchased with his own blood, Acts, Acts 20 and verse 28. So, when, when, when we're talking about the church, which Jesus purchased with his own blood, would you say that's pretty valuable? I mean, we're, we're in the Memorial, Memorial Day weekend. Tomorrow, a lot of people are going to be celebrating Memorial Day. And it's a day when we remember the, the cost that men and women paid so that we can have our freedom. We're remembering that. Veterans Day is to honor those who are living, and Memorial Day is to honor those that paid the price. And we say, well, you know what, that's, that's special. Our, our freedom is valuable because, you know, freedom isn't free. Well, what about the church? It wasn't free. It was, it was so important to God that he, number one, planned it before the world began. Number two, he made a, a, an essential part of the plan of man's salvation. He sent his son to die for it to the point that his son built it after he was raised from the dead, just to show you how important it was. He came back from the dead to build it. <laughs> and it was so important that it pleased God when he built it, when his son built the, 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 the church. Now, don't you think it's important because Christ died for it? He said, upon this rock I'll build my church, and he, he died for it. Now, does it have value? I mean, for the people that just look at the church, well, you know, church doesn't matter, organized religion is what's tearing up the country, blah, 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 blah. Really? That's not what the Bible says. That's not how God looks at the church. Now, I would agree that denominationalism is what's, what's running people, but it's, but it's not the Lord's church. The Lord's church has value. What, what, what value does a denomination have? I mean, let's, let's think about it. We're talking about the price of blood. The price of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Name one man-made church that can say they were bought with the blood of Christ. Now, now be careful because when you say, when you start naming one, the next question is going to be, all right, if, if it was purchased with the blood of Christ, show it in the Bible. Show it in the Bible where it was purchased with the blood of Christ. Show where it was paid for with the blood of Christ. I mean, if, you, if you're going, if you're going to tell that yes, it's so valuable that my that my Lord and Savior died for it, well, you want to show me the receipt, show me the bill of sale, show me the price you paid. Because friends, there's there is not a denomination, there's not a church of man in existence today that even comes remotely close to having the same value as the church that my Lord and Savior died for because he shed his blood for it. And that's why I know that these denominations are not part of the Lord's church because God didn't say anything about his son dying for them. Now, don't you want to be a part of the church that is so valuable and precious that it was paid for with the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter said in 1 Peter 1, verse 18, he says, For as much as ye know ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in his last times for you. Again, before the world was ever 
started, before the foundation were laid, Christ was determined he's going to lay down his life for the sins of mankind and purchase the church, the, the place where the saved would be placed so that man might have the hope of salvation. Now, does it have value? Does it have value? I've, I've seen these old American pickers or whatever and they're digging through and they find, you know, great antiques, antique road show, look how valuable this is. There's not a single antique heirloom anywhere that is as remotely precious, as valuable as the, as the church our Lord paid for with his blood, with his blood. Now, here's the question. So if the church is so valuable, how do you benefit from Christ purchasing the church with his blood? How do you benefit from that? Somebody, you know, somebody might say, well, the fact that Christ died means I'm benefiting from it. No, 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 no. Just because Christ died for it doesn't mean you benefit from it. You only benefit from it if you have access to it. You know, I... I here in the news, uh, if you pay attention to, uh, you know, what's going on in the in economics, you know, there are some companies that are they're they're moving when they move into a a community, everybody's excited because they're going to bring jobs. They're going to be jobs. I think up in uh, Oregon, maybe it is. You know, Amazon was going to uh, start a business up there, open up a uh, shop or whatever they want to call it and now they've decided that you know what taxes are so so high that they're not going to open it it's going to be like 700 jobs or whatever well how does a community benefit if a company comes in and opens a business well you said well it benefits because people get jobs and they're going to bring in you know other businesses and things like that's going to bring in tax revenue well okay the community might benefit from it but let's say a store. There's a store in Eden, uh, Lidl, Lidl, whatever it is. I mean, big, big nice building sitting right out there on on uh, Van Buren. It's not benefiting anybody. It may have benefited the contractors that, that built it, but it's not benefiting anybody. You know why? It's not open. So you have to go in the stores in order for to be to to get the benefits from it. Sam's Club. Somebody said, "Well, Sam's. What if Sam's Club?" Uh, Built a what if it was a Sam's Club built in in Madison or Mayadan? What if it was a Sam's Club built in Eden? Would that benefit the community? Oh yeah, it benefit the community. But would it benefit you directly? If you bought a membership, it would. See, if you if you became a member of Sam's Club, it benefits you. Yeah, you, know, you can go in, you can go to these stores now, and they got the little you know your little uh, club card or whatever. You know, you go to Food Line. They want to scan your rewards card or pharmacy. You got a reward. Everything's got a rewards card. Why? Well, because if you're a member, if you've got that thing, we'll give you a little discount. You can save. You know, you go down here to Sheets and you got a little card. You can save three cents a gallon. You go to Walmart. You got a Walmart card. You can save three, five cents a gallon, three or five cents a gallon, whatever it is, on gas. How they do that? Well, you got a membership. See. You get benefits by being a part of it. Well, friends, the only way you benefit from the church that Christ purchased with his blood is if you're a member of it. And all these people say, well, church is not important. Well, then how, do you, how can you get benefits from something that you think is not important? How are you getting benefits from something that you've, that you've said, well, it's, it's, it's not essential? Even though it's part of God's plan, even though it was pleasing to God for Christ to build it, even though it was in God's mind before the foundation of the world, how can you get possibly get any kind of benefit from that? Because you won't become a member of the Church of Christ. But the only way you're going to be benefit from the from Christ purchasing the church is if you become a member of of the church that Christ built. It's not buying clothes. If you've ever gone out and bought some clothes and never wore them, you know, the only way you benefit from some benefit from clothes is if you put them on. Right? You can 
I'm going to go out and buy a new car and you never drive it. Well, what benefit is it? What, 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 what's it benefiting you? You know, you go buy some clothes and, and you say, I'm, I'm cold. Well, have you put on your new clothes? Well, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, you won't benefit from it. If you don't benefit, I mean, if you're not going to use or take advantage of the things that are, that are available, how can, how can you then turn around and say, well, I'm, I'm benefiting from it? Listen, here's how important it is to be a member of the body of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Listen to what Paul says. Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. Now, do you want the benefit? Do you want those spiritual blessings? I think everybody wants those spiritual blessings. <clears throat> you can read through the book of Ephesians. You can find... Uh, bunches of these uh, of these blessings that are listed that that we find in Christ um, Ephesians 1 7 in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace so in whom that's in Christ we have forgiveness of sins we have redemption from his blood the riches of his grace Th these are what we have in Christ in 2nd Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10 Paul said, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. These are things that are in Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. I mean, don't you want these, don't you want these blessings? Don't you want these uh, uh these these spiritual blessings that are that are given. This is what I'm talking about. They're in Christ. Now listen. Guess what else is in Christ? Romans 12. Romans 12 verses 4 and 5. For as we have many members in one body. And all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ. And everyone members one of another. Now, do you think it's important to be in Christ? There's salvation in Christ. There's forgiveness of sins in Christ. There's no condemnation in Christ. Here's another one, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <coughs> Excuse me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse uh, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, all things, uh, old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. If you, if you would have all the blessings that are in Christ, then guess what? You have to know how to get into Christ. You have to be in Christ to receive those things. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ. It's Romans 3, verse 24. Um... Neither height nor depth nor depth nor any other creature can separate us from the love of God. Where's the love of God? Which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's Romans three and verse uh, thirty nine Romans eight verse thirty nine. Uh, do you think it's important to be in Christ? First Corinthians one verse two, Paul said unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified. In Christ Jesus. Does that sound important? Um, and so we're talking about all these things that are that are in Christ. Blessed are they that die in the Lord. Revelation um, was it thirteen fourteen? All right. So we're talking about uh, we're talking about all the blessings that are in Christ. All the blessings that are in Christ in whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Colossians 1.28 uh, I'm saying, brethren, friends, 
if you're if you want the blessings, you've got to be in Christ. And the church is in Christ. Romans 12, verses 4 and 5. So all the blessings are in Christ. How can you receive any of them outside of Christ? Outside of his body. Outside of the church, which is his body. Now, I'm, I'm asking you to think, friends. Do you have to be a member of the Church of Christ to be saved? Do you have to be a member of the Church of Christ to have all the blessings that are in Christ? Do you have to be a member of the Church of Christ in order to be in His body? The answer is yes to all those. Do you have to be a member of the body of Christ or be in Christ in order to have no condemnation? Yes. Do you have to be a member of the body of Christ to be a new creature? Yes. Do you have to be a member of the body of Christ to have forgiveness of sins? Yes. Do you have to be a member of the church of Christ in order to have uh, the, 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 the promise of, of, of eternal life? Yes. That's in Christ. If you want to have fellowship with all the saved and with God, where do you have to be? You have to be in Christ. Ephesians 2, verse 6, Paul said, He hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm, I'm saying, friends, I want you to answer your own question. Do you have to be a member of the Church of Christ to be saved? Well, seeing as Christ is the Savior of the body, and seeing as the body is the church, Seeing as Christ purchased the church with his own blood, seeing as it was part of God's will for Christ to purchase the church with his own blood, seeing as the church was part of God's eternal plan for Christ to die and purchase the church with his own blood, and seeing as God has placed all the saved in the church that was planned before the foundation of the world, which Christ died for with his own blood, seeing as it pleases the Father for Christ to build that church, which all the saved are, are, will be placed in, seems to me like you just can't get around. Yes, you need to be in the church of Christ in order to be saved and have all the blessings that are given to those who are in Christ. Why would you not want to be? Why would you not want to be part of the church of Christ? Why would you not want to be part of that? Now, I, I'm the same, friends. I'm trying to I'm trying to help you uh, answer your own question. I'm trying to help you uh, answer your own question about do you have to be a member of the Church of Christ? Listen to this in in First Corinthians chapter 15. I'm running out of time here. One, two minutes, two minutes. In First Corinthians, First Corinthians chapter uh, one. First uh, Corinthians 15, I'm sorry, First Corinthians 15 and verse 24. Then cometh the end when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the, church, the Father, when he has put down all rule and authority and all power. The church is the kingdom. Now, are you going to be in heaven in the end if you're not in the church that Christ died for, that he shed his blood for? that he bought with his own blood and that is part of God's plan for salvation of man? Is it, do you have to be a member of the body of Christ? Can you be saved outside of a body that, that God has specially designed for those who will be saved? Friends, you need to be a member of the Church of Christ. And I can help you do that. I can help you become one. Simply by doing what the Bible says. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess Christ before man, and be baptized for the remission of sins. Give me a call, 276-340-2653, a word from the Lord at gmail.com. I am out of time. Friends, if I can assist you in any way, please contact me, reach me, and I'll do what I can. Until next time, thanks for listening.